Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. We've seen Dindrin get beaten up, eaten up, and blown up quite a lot in the Mandalorian TV show. We've also seen him punch and shoot his way out of countless attacks and ambushes. So far, he's survived the journey that would have killed lesser men and Mandalorians, but just how powerful is Din Djarin? We don't really know, but that's exactly where we're going to be looking at today. We're going to look at his equipment, his armor, his training, and of course, his beloved Razor Crest, and determine just how effective of a fighter he is. When it comes to Mandalorians, armor is probably one of the most important parts of their culture and identity. It's even more important for Din Djarin because he's a part of the Children of the Watch, which is kind of a Mandalorian religious cult that has some pretty rigid rules about wearing armor. For instance, we know that Din Djarin is never supposed to take his helmet off. Now, in Episode 1, Din Djarin starts off with a pretty terrible and beat-up suit of armor. Like a lot of Mandalorians during the post-Imperial era, he couldn't afford true Beskar. But luckily, he was paid in a massive amount of Beskar after he successfully retrieved the Baby Yoda for his Imperial clients on one mission. Beskar, or Mandalorian iron, is probably one of the most durable metals in the galaxy. The material can only be found on Mandalore and its moon, so it's quite rare. After the Empire took over Mandalore, they basically seized control of this resource and made it pretty hard for any Mandalorian to get their hands on it. Forging Mandalorian armor was also no easy task and guarded jealously by Mandalorian armorsmiths who would rather die than give up the secrets of making Beskar armor. For good reason too, with full body Beskar armor on, a Mandalorian is basically impenetrable, especially against conventional blaster rounds. The Beskar is more than tough enough to absorb the heat and energy from each incoming bolt and still keep the wearer conscious from the impacts of the rounds. Beskar can even turn away lightsaber blades. Special high-powered sniper rifles can pierce Beskar, but only at closer ranges. You also have special types of weapons like disruptors, which probably could fry a Mandalorian within his Beskar. But for the most part, a Mandalorian in full armor is basically a tank. It should be noted that most suits of Mandalorian armor have gaps that allow for maneuverability, but also leave the limbs of the wearer exposed. The Mandalorian also has a jetpack booster on his Beskar armor. This gives him a lot more mobility, which in most combat situations is a win. It seems like the Children of the Watch enjoyed dropping in on enemies from the sky above. Not sure how smart that is, but I guess if you are blaster-proof, does it really matter how you kill your enemies? The more important advantage that the jetpack gives Mandalorians is the ability to bug out when they are being overwhelmed. Jetpacks were one of the key technologies that leveled the playing field between Mandalorians and the Jedi. But as far as Din Djarin's personal suit of Beskar armor, it's probably some of the best gear that I've ever seen a Mandalorian wear. It's not quite as bulky as Paz Vizsla's heavy armor, but it's thick enough to really afford Din Djarin the protection he needs. It's definitely a lot more solid than Bubba Fett's gear. Also, most suits of Mandalorian armor are passed down from one generation to another. The fact that Din Djarin has a newly created Beskar suit is pretty remarkable. It means it's a lot more durable and probably will last him a lot longer. Now, before we continue, a special word from our sponsor for today's video, Ridge Wallets. This is a super sleek metal wallet that has a lifetime warranty. It's about the size of a credit card and can hold around 12 cards plus cash. It's the perfect present for the holidays, and honestly, it can be quite life-changing, especially for individuals who are used to carrying around very bulky and unorganized wallets. I personally have been rocking the carbon fiber model, which it actually does taste like carbon, yum. Now check out our description below if you guys want more information about this product. Also use our promo code, GENTECH, that's all caps if you want a 10% discount. Well, thank you for your patience, on to the rest of the video. For one reason or another, the Mandalorian oftentimes gets into hand-to-hand -hand combat situations or melee fighting range with thugs. The armor seems to limit his mobility somewhat and the helmet probably limits his visibility as well. At the same time, he's basically able to absorb punches with his head and basically break the bones of any attacker stupid enough to punch him in the Beskar. Unless it's Gina Carano, of course, who is most likely half Masasi. Dinger Rin has a pretty small stature and he does seem kind of like a weak individual, so he doesn't have that much knockout power, but then again, that's not his usual strategy. See, Mandalorian is equipped with all sorts of interesting weapons that are bolted onto their body parts. 
And so when the Mandalorian encounters a more tough opponent, his strikes are designed to create space between him and his enemies so that he can utilize all those very dangerous gadgets. Din Djarin does seem to occasionally have problems with weapons retention during melee scuffles, but that's not a huge issue because again, he has so many backups. A Mandalorian's weapons loadout is kind of ridiculous. It's more like something you would see in a video game. But as we mentioned before the Mandalorians encountered the Jedi a long time ago, they were stunned by how powerful they were and they kind of became obsessed with finding ways to kill the Jedi. So now they are completely over-prepared for your average gun battle. The Mandalorian's primary weapon is the Ambin Phase Pulse Blaster Rifle. This is a pretty strange weapon and has a lot of drawbacks, but it also has a lot of advantages. For one, this rifle is extremely long and not very useful for ship interiors or CQC situations. It's basically a full-length Kentucky rifle with a giant prong-shaped bayonet on the end. The Phase Pulse Blaster's main firing system uses energy cartridges that have to be breech-loaded one by one. While the Phase Pulse Blaster can disintegrate an enemy target and is pretty useful for assassinations or attacking heavily armored individuals or enemies behind cover, it's much less useful in a target-rich environment when rapid firing is needed. Now, this rifle also has a secondary firing system which can send a powerful electrical shock that can take down a fully grown Ravenac or force a crate Dragon to open its mouth in pain. That's pretty impressive for a weapon that small. We don't have a name for Dingerin's blaster pistols yet, but it's based off of the Bergman 1896 pistol. And it seems pretty standard from a Star Wars point of view. Dingerin generally only uses one blaster instead of dual wielding. The blaster seems to have a pretty decent firing rate and doesn't overheat very quickly. Dingerin also has a flamethrower, which draws fuel from his jetpack. It has a range of a few meters and is always available because it's wrist mounted. On his other wrist is a grappling hook, which can be used for a variety of combat moves. His most deadly weapon, however, is his wrist-mounted Whistling Sparrows. These humming missiles can get Dingerin out of some pretty tricky situations. Like all Mandalorians, Dingerin is basically over-equipped and prepared for almost any situation. Oh, and he also has a knife, which is important because knife fights are the best way to really get to know someone. While Dindarin has pretty solid aim with both his blaster and his rifle, his strategy and tactics are quite simple. He's the type of guy who rushes headfirst into any combat situation. You could say this is because he wears Beskar armor and it gives him a sense of invincibility, but he also did this when he was wearing some basic Durasteel armor. Even though he often rushes into situations and compromises himself, Din Djarin has pretty good reflexes and is well drilled in using the many weapons bolted onto his body, which makes him very effective in close quarter battles. It would kind of be interesting to see him use his brains more in future battles, but then again, when you are covered in Biscar, why use your brains at all? The Razor Crest, like Din Djarin's old suit of armor, is a pretty beat up vessel. It's survived multiple crashes, been hit by enemy laser fire, completely stripped down to its airframe by Jawas, and almost eaten by an aquatic monster. The Razor Crest is definitely a very tough ship with a very strong airframe, but it lacks maneuverability and speed. More importantly, the old gunship lacks weapons. Aside from a pair of aftermarket laser cannons, the Mandalorian doesn't have much else to attack or defend. There aren't torpedo tubes or missile launchers, you don't have countermeasures, there isn't even a turret that can at least defend this ship from enemy fighters. So it's basically just a civilian ship that used to be designed for military purposes. And to be honest, after the Mon Calamari tune-up, it got, I don't really think it's spaceworthy anymore. And considering how impressive Mandalorian ships are, like the Fang fighter, the Razor Crest is definitely kind of disappointing and one of the Mandalorian's larger weaknesses. Despite having very limited options with his Razor Crest, Dindarin manages to survive some pretty dangerous situations. He definitely is an experienced pilot and able to pull off a wide variety of very dangerous and advanced maneuvers in his beat up ship. He's able to survive a one on one duel with a bounty hunter guild starfighter, and he even manages to outrun a pair of X Wings. Although Din Djarin does crash his ship occasionally, he seems to know just how hard he can push his beloved Razor Crest. But then again, his piloting skills probably deserves a better ship. Baby Yoda is a blessing and a curse. Without Baby Yoda in his possession, the Mandalorian wouldn't be chased by so many bounty hunters, opportunist criminal scum, and Imperial remnant forces. At the same time, the Baby Yoda can do some pretty awesome things like restraining large enemies from moving or healing what should be a fatal wound. 
The problem is the Baby Yoda does need constant protection, and it's hard for Din Djarin to communicate tactics or strategies to the Baby Yoda. He's kind of this random X Factor that occasionally steps in and saves the day. Other times he's just off doing his own thing, which usually involves eating squirmy, creepy crawlers. So that's our rundown of Din Djarin's equipment, gear, and his abilities. As you can see on the ground, He's pretty much impossible to defeat. He's got all of his angles covered, but it's really when he gets into space and that really terrible ship of his when he starts uh, becoming a little more vulnerable to enemy attack. Hopefully sometime in the near future, he upgrades his ship into something a little nicer. We'll see. Anyway, guys, let me know in the comment section below what you think about Din Djarin. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our Mandalorian coverage. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.